I'm sitting in a classroom, and my eyes are fixated on the clock that seems to be ticking slower than usual. The tension feels like it's stretching into an endless void of time. The room is filled with the sound of the overhead lights and the faint scribble of Emily's pencil on her notepad. Mr. Johnson, our supervisor for this agonizing session, is seated at his desk at the front of the room. He's scanning through some papers, and from the look on his face, he's as thrilled to be here as the rest of us. Around me sit a few other students who, like me, would rather be anywhere else. Emily is to my left, working on some homework, probably trying to make the most out of a bad situation. Mark is slouched in his chair with his eyes glued to his phone, likely scrolling through social media. Sarah is doodling in her notebook. Her earbuds are in, but at a low volume, so she can still hear if Mr. Johnson says anything. Jake is sitting near the back with his eyes closed, perhaps just trying to catch a few minutes of sleep. The atmosphere is filled with a kind of restless energy that comes from being stuck in a place you don't want to be. Suddenly, the school's alarm system bears to life, cutting through the monotonous atmosphere like a knife. The loud sound startles all of us, snapping us out of our individual worlds. Attention all students and staff. The school is now in lockdown. Please stay inside your classroom and keep your doors locked. This is not a drill. Mr. Johnson's face tightens and he immediately jumps into action. He rushes to the classroom door, turns the lock, and then hurries to switch off the lights. All right, you know the drill, kids. Lights off, huddle in the corner, away from the windows, he instructs, his voice tinged with a level of concern we've never heard before. For a split second, we all just look at each other, our eyes meeting the dim light filtering through the closed blinds. The room feels suddenly smaller and more confined. Then, almost as if on cue, we move simultaneously. We gather our things and scurry to the far corner of the room, huddling together as we've been trained to do in countless drills before. Emily's eyes meet mine as we settle into our makeshift safe zone. Do you think it's real this time? She whispers, her voice tinged with both curiosity and fear. I doubt it. Jake interjects before I can answer. Probably another stupid drill. They've been doing a lot of these lately. But the tone of Mr. Johnson's voice and the urgency in his movements tell a different story. He pulls out his phone, his fingers moving rapidly as he starts texting someone, maybe another teacher or perhaps the school administration. His brows furrow deeper with each passing second. Finally, he looks up, meeting our anxious gazes. I'm not getting any information from other teachers, he says, his voice steady, but his eyes revealing a hint of worry. Just stay put and keep your phones on silent. The room falls into an uneasy silence, filled only with the sound of our collective breaths and the occasional creak of the building settling. The absence of information hangs heavy in the air, leaving us with nothing but our own thoughts and the unsettling realization that this situation is unlike any other we faced before. Mark, unable to contain his restlessness, pulls out his phone and starts scrolling through social media with hurried swipes. He's clearly searching for any clues or updates about the lockdown. After a moment, he looks up and says, nobody is saying anything about this online, not a single tweet or post. Maybe it's just a drill after all. Sarah, who's been pensively staring at the floor, raises her eyebrows and locks eyes with Mark. Yeah, but why would the announcement specifically say it's not a drill if it is? That's not standard procedure, she questions. I chime in, offering a different angle. Maybe they're trying to scare us on purpose, you know, to see how we'd react in a more stressful situation, like a test within a test. Emily shakes her head vigorously, visibly distressed by the thought. That's messed up if it's true. My anxiety is already through the roof. They can't play games with us like that. Before anyone can continue the conversation, Mr. Johnson interrupts, his voice is laced with irritation and urgency. Guys, could you all just be quiet? No talking. We need to listen for any instructions or updates. We all nod, falling into an uneasy silence. We huddle closer, each lost in our own thoughts and fears. Every so often, the silence is punctuated by the sound of a phone buzzing with a notification. We all hear it, but no one moves to check their messages or updates. 
It's as if we're collectively holding our breath, waiting for some sort of sign that will tell us it's safe to move, to talk, to breathe a little easier. The atmosphere is thick with tension, each passing second stretching longer and longer as we wait for something, anything, to happen. Mr. Johnson's gaze is now fixed on the door, as if expecting it to burst open at any moment. The rest of us exchange quick, anxious glances, our eyes speaking volumes in the absence of words. Minutes feel like hours as they tick by slowly, the tension in the room intensifying with each passing second. Mr. Johnson is engrossed in his phone, his eyes darting back and forth across the screen. He appears to be messaging someone, possibly seeking updates from other teachers or the administration. This doesn't make sense. He mutters to himself, his face reflecting a mix of confusion and rising anxiety. Breaking the extended silence, Emily finally speaks up, her voice tinged with frustration and concern. Should we do something? I mean, this is weird, right? Lockdowns don't usually last this long. Yeah, I'm getting really antsy here. Mark chimes in, shifting uncomfortably in his seat. Are we just going to sit here all day or what? Mr. Johnson exhales a long sigh, visibly struggling to maintain his composure. Look, I have no more information than you do, but the guidelines are clear. We are supposed to stay put during lockdown, so that's what we're doing. Jake, who has been unusually quiet, finally speaks up. What if it's something serious? He asks, his voice barely above a whisper, but carrying the weight of the fear we're all starting to feel. Like really serious, not just a drill or a test. Mr. Johnson puts his phone down and looks at each of us, making eye contact as if trying to reassure us, or maybe himself. If it's something serious, then all the more reason to stay put. I get it, you're anxious, restless, and you want answers. But as it stands, the safest thing to do, the only thing we can do, is to stay right here. We nod, some of us more reluctantly than others. The room falls back into silence, but it's a different kind of silence now. A heavy, anxious quiet filled with unspoken fears and unanswered questions. We're all starting to feel it. This is not a typical lockdown. Each minute stretches on, and there's still no word on what's going on. Mr. Johnson's attempts to get updates on his phone have yielded nothing, and our group's collective anxiety is rising. Finally, Mr. Johnson can't take it any longer. I can't just sit here doing nothing, he announces, visibly frustrated. I'm going to step out for a moment and try to find some information from the other teachers. Before we can voice our concerns, he's already unlocking the door. He gives us a stern look, warning us to stay put before stepping out into the hallway. The door clicks shut behind him. We're left in a collective state of heightened anxiety. Our eyes dart into the clock, then to the door, and back again. Minutes drag on. Mr. Johnson's absence is a gaping hole in the room, filling us with dread about what might be happening outside. Just when we think we can't take the suspense any longer, Jake stands up. I've had enough of this waiting, he says. I'm going to take a quick look outside to see what's going on. The room explodes with reactions. Are you out of your mind? Sarah blurts out. What if it's dangerous? And what if it's a false alarm? We need to know, Jake argues back, already moving toward the door. Despite our reservations, we all know that he has a point. The uncertainty is unbearable, and we need some kind of information to gauge how serious this situation is. Jake cautiously peeks his head out the door. Just as quickly, he jerks his head back inside and slams the door shut. His face is pale, drained of color. I saw something, he stammers, locking the door again. It was a shadowy figure, but it was all wrong. The way it moved. That was no human, I'm telling you. His words spark immediate chaos. People are talking over each other, fear evident in every voice. The panic is intense. Okay, everyone calm down. Emily shouts. We can't just stay here. Whatever that thing is, we need to avoid it and find a way out of this school. Mark, who has been mostly quiet, speaks up, his voice shaky but resolute. I can't believe I'm saying this, but maybe we should listen to Emily. We can't just sit here. 
Sarah looks incredulous. Are we really considering leaving the classroom? In this situation, what choice do we have? I ask, my own voice tinged with desperation. Mr. Johnson hasn't come back, and Jake just saw something that he says isn't human. We can't just sit here like sitting ducks. Jake, still visibly shaken, steps back into the center of the room. If we're doing this, we need some kind of weapons, something to defend ourselves with. Anything is better than nothing. We all scan the classroom for potential makeshift weapons. We grab rulers, a stapler and scissors. We look at our assembled items, realizing they're not much, but they're better than going out there empty-handed. The air is thick with tension as we prepare to leave the classroom. The decision has been made, and there's no turning back now. We have to find a way out of this school, and we have to do it while avoiding whatever non-human entity Jake saw lurking in the hallways. Taking a deep breath, Emily turns the key and slowly opens the door. We all clutch our makeshift weapons tightly, eyes wide and hearts pounding. Emily steps into the hallway first, then Mark, followed by Sarah, Jake, and finally me. Emily reaches back in to turn off the classroom lights, plunging us into the darkness of the hallway. The absence of light makes everything feel even more surreal. We move cautiously, our steps muted, but still seem to echo in the unnerving silence of the school. We pass door after door, all closed and presumably locked, just like ours had been. The thought crosses my mind that there could be other people holed up in these rooms, just as frightened and uninformed as we are. Then we hear it, a sound that freezes us in our tracks, a low, guttural growl that reverberates through the corridor. It's coming from up ahead, from the direction we were walking toward. The sound is inhuman. We look at each other with our eyes wide, and no one needs to say it. We have to change course. Let's turn back, Emily whispers, her voice barely above a breath. We can try to go through the gym and out the side entrance. Everyone nods, too scared to voice any objections. We quickly but quietly turn around and start walking back the way we came. Our senses heighten to an almost painful degree. As we continue walking through the hallways, the atmosphere grows increasingly unsettling. The lights above us flicker intermittently, casting strange shadows on the walls. Every flicker makes my heart skip a beat, as if the school is sending us a warning. The air feels thicker, almost suffocating. As we walk, distant noises echo through the empty corridors. There are eerie sounds, low moans, soft bangs, and creaks that make the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. These sounds are out of place, as if they come from a different realm entirely. We try to open various classroom doors as we pass, hoping to find a safe place or another way out. But each door is jammed or locked, resisting our efforts to open them. This just heightens our sense of dread and urgency. Jake points to the floor, and we all see it. Mr. Johnson's phone. My stomach churns with worry. Sarah picks it up, confirming it's his by quickly glancing at the notifications on the screen. This is really bad, guys. Mr. Johnson would never just abandon his phone like this. Something must have happened to him. Okay, let's not panic, Emily says, trying to keep her voice steady. We have to keep going. Right now, we can't do anything for Mr. Johnson. We need to focus on getting ourselves to safety. We finally arrive at the main exit, our hearts pounding in anticipation. Emily lunges at the bar handle, pushing with all her might. Nothing happens. The door doesn't move an inch. Mark steps up next, putting his shoulder into it and pushing as hard as he can. Still, the door remains shut. Mark grabs the fire extinguisher hanging on the wall nearby and takes a few steps back. I'm going to try to break it, he says, determination in his eyes. He swings the heavy canister at the glass door. But there's only a small dent in the glass. Mark swings again and again, each time with the same result. The glass won't break. Emily examines the door closely and then looks back at us. This is safety glass. It's made to withstand impacts like this. We're not getting out this way. What's our next move? Jake's voice is tinged with desperation as he looks around at us, clearly at a loss for what to do next. 
Emily takes a deep breath before speaking. We should head to the school office. They have a PA system there. Maybe we can use it to call for help, or at least let anyone else who's in the building know what's going on. It's an unanimous decision. We've got no better options. Turning away from the main entrance, we begin the trek to the school office, which is clear across the building. Every step feels like a risk, but staying put isn't an option either. Then we hear it again, that awful guttural growl. It's closer this time, too close for comfort. We lock eyes for a split second, and the unspoken consensus is clear. We need to run. We break into a sprint, hearts pounding, and our breaths are shallow and quick. As we round a corner, my eyes catch a fleeting movement. It's a shadow, darker than the surrounding darkness, moving along the wall. I can't make out its shape, but I don't need to. My gut tells me we don't want to meet whatever is casting it. We burst into the school office, adrenaline propelling us forward. The door slams shut behind us. Hands shaking, we lock it as fast as humanly possible. Casping for air, we lean against the walls and desks, trying to catch our breath. For the moment, we're safe, or at least as safe as we can be in this situation. Emily rushes over to the office phone, picking it up and immediately dialing 911. A moment passes and her face falls. It's dead, she announces. Sarah, who's been looking around the office, points at the PA system. What about that? Can we use it to call for help or something? Emily doesn't waste a second. She presses the button to activate the PA system, her fingers poised to speak into it. But there's nothing, no crackle, no hum, just an eerie silence that deepens our sense of isolation. Our cell phones have no signal, the landlines are dead, and now the PA system doesn't work either. Mark states, breaking the silence that settled over us. His voice is shaky, and his words lay bare the bleak reality we're facing. The weight of our situation hangs heavy in the room. We're not just stuck in the school. We're completely isolated, cut off from the outside world. And whatever is out there with us knows it too. Suddenly, the locked office door starts to creak open. My heart races as a figure comes into the doorway. The entity is here, and its appearance is unlike anything I've ever seen. The entity is shadowy, but not entirely formless. It seems to be made of a dark, Swirling mist that constantly changes, making it hard to focus on any specific features. Occasionally, what looks like eyes appear, glowing faintly before fading back into the darkness. The air around it feels thick and heavy, almost as if it's warping the space it occupies. It's terrifying, but also fascinating. Frozen in place, we can do nothing but watch as the entity surveys the room. Its eyes, or what seem like eyes, Lock onto each of us briefly. It's as if it's studying us, analyzing us. Just when the tension feels unbearable, the entity does something unexpected. It turns away from us and glides smoothly out of the room, pulling the door shut behind it. For a moment, none of us move, still gripped by the shock and confusion of what just transpired. The entity looked at us, seemed to consider us, but didn't harm us. What could that mean? We all remained frozen, unable to comprehend what just happened. It didn't harm us, Emily finally manages to say, her voice tinged with disbelief, but also a hint of relief. But what does it want? Mark puts into words the question that is hovering in all our minds. His eyes scan the room, as if expecting an answer to materialize out of thin air. We can't stay here, Sarah says decisively, cutting through the lingering tension. Not after that. We need to go somewhere else, somewhere we have room to move, to plan. The gym, I suggest, thinking quickly. It's a big open space. If that entity comes back, we'll at least have room to move around. Maybe even escape. The suggestion seems to resonate with everyone. Nods of agreement circulate around the room, each accompanied by a look that says we're all in this together, for better or worse. Picking up our makeshift weapons, we cautiously unlock the office door and step out into the unnerving quiet of the school halls. Adrenaline courses through my veins as we navigate the corridors. We walk in a single file. 
eyes darting around as if expecting the walls themselves to jump at us. The school feels different, darker, colder. The only sounds are our own breathing and the occasional creak of the old building settling, or so we hope. We've barely made it halfway to the gym when we hear it. A guttural growl reverberating through the hallway. It's closer this time, much closer. We freeze momentarily and exchange looks of terror in the dim light. In here. Emily says, spotting a janitor's closet to our right. We don't argue. We dive into the closet, piling in as quietly as possible. Emily shuts the door behind us, leaving us in near total darkness. A few seconds later, we hear the soft, echoing thud of footsteps, or whatever it is that the entity uses to move. It sounds like it's just outside the door, and for a terrifying moment, I think it's going to open it. But it doesn't. The footsteps grow fainter, moving away from us. Only when they've completely disappeared does anyone dare to speak. Was it looking for us? Sorrow whispers, her voice shaky. I don't know, but we can't stay here, Mark says, his voice barely above a whisper. We need to get to the gym. I can feel the nods of agreement more than I can see them. We wait for a few more minutes, straining our ears for any sound. When we don't hear anything, Emily carefully opens the closet door, peeks out, and then nods. We're clear. Let's move, she says. As quietly as we entered, we exit the closet, each of us hyper aware of our surroundings. Despite the close encounter, we continue toward the gym, now with even more urgency. After a while of careful walking, the gymnasium doors come into view and we feel a small sense of relief. But we're not there yet, and we know better than to let our guard down. We reach the gym doors and Emily pushes them open with a slow, cautious motion. The doors creak as we step inside. Let's check the exit, Mark says, pointing to the emergency door on the far end of the gym. We move quickly but quietly across the gym floor, avoiding the center court as if it's a trap. We reach the emergency exit and Mark pushes on the bar handle. It doesn't move. He tries again, using more force this time, but the door remains stubbornly shut. It's jammed or locked or something, Mark says, frustration evident in his voice. So, we're trapped here too, Sarah adds, her voice tinged with despair. Jake picks up a basketball from a nearby rack and hurls it at the door in a fit of frustration. The ball bounces off with a loud thud, accomplishing nothing. We have to figure something out, Emily says, her eyes scanning the gym as if searching for answers. We can't just stay here. It's then that we all feel it, a shift in the air, as if the room itself is holding its breath. We turn to look and there it is, the entity, appearing as if from nowhere near the entrance. Again we freeze, our eyes locked on its indistinct, shadowy form. It seems to look back at us, and though it has no face that we can discern, we get the sense that it's just as confused as we are. Then, without warning, it disappears, leaving us in a state of heightened bewilderment and fear. What was that? What does it want? Jake asks. We've barely taken a few steps out of the gym, or the school's alarm system suddenly blares and makes us jump. Attention, the lockdown is now over. Repeat, the lockdown is over. The announcement echoes through the halls, and almost immediately, the lights flicker back to their normal brightness. The doors click, signaling they're unlocked. What just happened? Sarah asks, her eyes wide. Is it over? Just like that. Mark echoes the disbelief we're all feeling. I don't know, but let's not waste time, Emily says. We need to get out of here now. We make our way to the main entrance, half expecting the doors to still be jammed, but they give way easily this time. Bursting out into the open air, we find a crowd of police and frantic parents waiting outside the school. As the police take our statements, I can't help but look around for Mr. Johnson, but he's nowhere to be found. No one seems to have any answers, and an uneasiness settles over me. Weeks pass, and life seems to fall back into a strange sort of normalcy. We return to school, but the atmosphere is different now, tainted with a collective unease that no one speaks about. Rumors swirl about what happened during the lockdown, 
but nothing comes close to the truth of what we experienced. And yet, no official explanation is ever given, neither for Mr. Johnson's disappearance nor for the entity. Have you had anything new? I ask Emily one day as we sit in the lunchroom. Nothing, she says, shaking her head. It's like it never happened, except for Mr. Johnson still being missing. And the school just replaced him like it's business as usual. And what about, you know, I lower my voice at the entity. No sightings, no mentions, nothing, Emily replies. It's as if it vanished into thin air. I nod, but I can't shake the feeling that we're missing a crucial piece of the puzzle. We talk about other things, about homework and upcoming tests. But it feels like we're skirting around a giant elephant in the room, an enigma that remains unsolved. Days turn into weeks, and the entity becomes nothing more than a shadow in the back of our minds, an unanswered question that we've all but stopped asking. And yet, when I walk through the school hallways, or when a door creaks unexpectedly, I find myself holding my breath, half expecting to see that indistinct form once again. But it never comes, and no answers are ever provided. Life moves on, but the events of that day leave a permanent imprint on us. Even as we dive back into the routine of school and daily life, a part of us remains tethered to those unanswered questions. The entity, whatever it was, remains an enigma, a spectral presence that has vanished as mysteriously as it appeared, leaving us in a state of perpetual wondering.